Order. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, uh, boys and girls, sacrificers and sacrifices. Welcome to chapter two of Rene Girard's Things Hidden Since the Foundation of the World. Here again with the uh, celebrated Thomas Hamelrick and Owen Cox. Hello. So today's chapter is called The Development of Culture and Institutions. And the thesis is very interesting. It can be staged very simply. In this chapter, Gerard says that all cultural institutions, all human institutions have their common origin in sacrifice, in the original surrogate victim as the thing that comes about to save the tribe from its medic conflict. Um, he also says that religion is the origin of all other institutions, that, that the origin of the sacred is precisely uh, coming from this, from this sacrifice, uh, the origin of the sacred, the origin of culture, and it's all connected to this ritual. So to start off, um, gentlemen, do we have any highlights that came up for you as you study this chapter, any notes that come up that we want to start off with? I liked his attack against, um, I forget what he calls it, whether it's cultural Platonism, but that was quite a, a funny term, especially in the context of people complaining in the field of anthropology about cultural appropriation or whatever. But Gerard is saying, no, cultural Platonism. And, uh, and what is he attacking here? Well, I think this is where he's kind of situating himself in his conversation, both with the structural schools of anthropology and then the post-structural or the deconstructive schools of anthropology. And so I think it's the structural schools that he's accusing of being Platonist in the sense that they look at various cultures and their institutions and assume that whatever the institutions are there doing is the reason that they're there, as if the, the form of the institution is some kind of platonic ideal. So I guess, you know, the marriage rituals and the marriage institutions are there for the purpose of marriage. The funeral institutions are there for the purpose of funerals. The, the religious institutions are there for the purpose of religion. The eating rituals are there for the purpose of eating and so on and so forth. I think I might be wrong because there's not my field of expertise, but I think that's how he's kind of describing the structural school, which he accuses of being Platonist. Then of course, there's the deconstructive school or the post-structural school, which, um, if I understand their critique right, they're kind of saying, no, anthropologists have read our own categories into the institutions and rituals of primitive cultures, of other cultures. Actually, it's not the right move at all to try and describe them in some kind of universal or platonic categories of ideals. They have to just be understood in terms of their own symbols, symbols, their own signs. But what this does is it divorces us even well, a long way from any kind of absolute or universal theory of what culture is and why culture works. And this is where Gerard inserts himself as actually saying, no, both of these interpretations are wrong because both of them miss the common core at the, at the foundation of culture, at the foundation of ritual, at the foundation of institution, which as Daniel already mentioned, is according to his theory, the scapegoating mechanism and the, the finding of surrogate victims to reproduce the, um, the pacifying effect that finding a victim has. Very cool. That's the, I think you've just given a very comprehensive overview of the chapter because there's this underlying that this chapter happens in parallel between like two layers, right? The one layer is precisely this attack and this attempt to differentiate himself, Gerard, from the <clears throat> from these academic schools of his time, from I believe the, you know, both structuralists by completing them and post-structuralists by adding this extra layer of the primeval sacrifice. So all throughout the chapter, you know, sandwiched in with insights, elaborating the theory of, of the development of cultural institutions, you will also find what to me sounds even a little bit gossipy, right? It's him just jabbing with indirect strikes here and there. It's complete gossip, my God. But, uh, but I like it. But, but you do feel like Girard is doing this double discourse. On one hand, like, going against the, the the current school and on the other hand going and explaining and elaborating his theory and just to sort of finish off very quickly like this main point can be summarized as let's not be retroactive 
let's not replace cause with effect. Uh, the institution is not the cause for whatever lies underneath it. The intolerable truths, the idea that intolerable truths like death invent the institutions that humans create to mask them, like the funeral rites, is a lie. He doesn't say that, oh my God, death is so horrible and therefore we mask it with some ritual on top of it. He says that that's a lie. And what happens is precisely the other way around. That death uh, is, is, a, is a sort of a major resource for life and society because of its pacifying effect and so on. And therefore it is built into a into a institution. So it's the other way around. I don't know how you guys understand this. Yeah, yeah this is, it's, uh, I think this is a, a very important concept to, to, to start with. I mean, that's very appropriate that, that, that we start with highlighting that cultural Platonism. And just to give a, a clear example of what that means. So there's something like a sacred kingship, right? So you, you have kings and, and, and these kings are then, um, they, they, these kings are then considered sacred, right? And so often it is thought as if that there's, there's some obvious reason why kings exist and just turning them into something sacred or, or having rituals around kingship that is something that comes out of kingship itself, right? So it's the kingship itself that is that is primordial, that is there, and then the rituals and the religion around it follows from that institution. And this is basically, this, this is what Girard calls cultural Platonism, because you assume that kings just exist. You know, there's some smart person that suddenly is capable of gathering a tribe or, or, a, or, a, or a gang around him, and, and, and lead that gang, be, be basically, a, you know, Nietzschean overman, so to say, right? So a leader. And, and we just assume that, that that's just there. That's just a given. So that's what, what, what Girard called cultural play, uh, Platonism. And, and in the case of the king, so, so maybe we should kind of explain what a king really is, right? So we have this, so just to recapul recapitulate the previous uh, session, right? So this, this very core uh, cultural uh, mechanism that Girard talks about. So the humans are mimetic. So they, they, they copy desire from each other. That means they go into competition because they want the same thing. So you get conflict. How do you solve conflict? Well, you find uh, a, a random victim and the whole tribe unites again, forgets its conflict by by transferring all its, its resentment and its hatred onto that single victim. And that victim is then killed. The, the tribe is unified again in peace. And that means there's something sacred happened, right? It went from conflict to focusing the conflict on a victim to peace. And so the victim is deified. So before the victim is killed, the victim is, is, uh, the victim is vilified. So it's considered malevolent. And then when the victim is killed, the, the victim actually becomes a god because the dead victim has unified, um, has unified the tribe. So, and what is what is now? Where does this where does this this kingship come from according to Girard? Well, some some uh, victims, they were actually um, they were actually so so and so so another thing that we should point out is that this 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 uh, mechanism was first very very crude, very raw. And then afterwards, this whole mechanism of, of uh, violence, finding a scapegoat, killing the scapegoat, this was then turned into, into religion. This is basically what religion is. It's, it's rules to kill scapegoats so you, you can pacify the, the, um, the society, right? But then these religious structures, they started being very elaborate. So a scapegoat was chosen and then the scapegoat was kept around for a couple of, uh, of days or even weeks uh, because that was part of the ritual. And sometimes that, that victim actually gained a lot of power because it was there and it was, it was, uh, it was um, um, associated with this, with this magical sacred that happened after, the, after killing the scapegoat. So then gradually some scape, scapegoats, they became kings. So what is a king according to Girard? A king is nothing else than a delayed scapegoat. It's the scapegoat that wasn't killed because somehow that scapegoat kind of found a, a place in the tribe in, in a religious structure. And typically, then you find a, a substitute scapegoat that is killed instead of the original scapegoat. And that's basically a good example of what, what Haji Rart sees. Like, well, it's these in institutions, they come from rituals. And it's not the, the, it's not the rituals that come from the inst institutions. And it seems like that little misrecognition, that make on a sense, 
uh, he's, he speaks of it in the following sentence, right? The death of the victim transforms relationship, relations within the community. The change from discord to harmony is not attributed to its actual cause, the unifying mimesis of collective violence, but to the victim itself. So people think it's the victim itself that has the power, not the fact that everybody gets together and gangs up on them. So you don't look at yourself or the unifying effect of everybody committing collective murder, but you look at the victim, victim itself and then slowly you, you deify it. He, he gives another very cute example, which is when the, the Ainu, I think they're in Japan, they take a bear cub when uh, the bear cub is obviously a baby and they raise the cub with, with the children of the tribe. They treat it as a pet, as a sacred pet, as a cute pet. And uh, afterwards, after a little bit of time, they kill it and everybody eats it. And, and, and therefore it becomes sacred. So what they do is, is they look at the victim as the sacred. They don't look at the killing as the sacred. And this collective killing uh, is the mechanism that Gerard says, hey guys, look under the surface. It's actually the ganging up on the victim and the shedding of blood that's pacifying the community. It's not the, the crown on the king itself that's having that effect. Yeah, I think it's related. Go on. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I think it's important also to, to look at some of the, um, the evidence he cites around this theory that scapegoats turned into kings because it seems as though it is a weird thing to wrap your head around but so some of the stuff that he points to is that often um i think thomas already mentioned there's a delay between say someone being chosen as a victim and someone being then actually executed especially once culture has moved from if we remember last time there's the kind of very prehistoric thing where there's just mimetic escalation fighting somebody gets killed that's kind of stage one and then stage two when the sacrifice is institutionalized as ritual as such when a certain class probably the priestly class realize oh actually if we repeat this say every sunday or whenever it will be then we're gonna be then we don't actually have to get into that fight in the most uncontrolled way however so going back to where i started there is this delayed period between a victim being selected and then being executed uh, in various cultures. And often what happens in this period is that the selected victim is treated in quite a, we might say, royal way. They often get to break some of the taboos and the prohibitions that the rest of the community are uh, beholden to at all times. They get to eat the sacred foods. Maybe they even get to engage in, in sexual rituals that, uh, that other people don't get to engage in. They get to commit the very taboos that the culture has prohibited so as to prevent itself from getting into some kind of romantic escalation. Now, uh, I think Gerard's explanation for this is that, well, it's to do with actually enabling the people to view the victim as guilty, as actually being worthy of the, the hatred, the frustration that's directed towards it. But if this, uh, this person who gets to exist in a kind of prolonged life without death, where they can uh, cross the usual taboos, doesn't end up being executed, which is the theory that like Thomas pointed out, then they might end up with what we know as the divine right of kings, right? Yeah. Kings exist above the law. Kings can go and fuck the women, fuck the, what's it, the law of the first night, whatever it is. The king makes the law in some sense. The king exists above the usual taboos and prohibitions. And this is an important social, social effect. Something yeah. comes up that I want to jump in on that very quickly. So it seems as if Gerard is saying that the sacred is just sacrificial foreplay. And that's where its power comes from. And as you said that, I, rem I, I thought of this passage on page 67, where Gerard says that in Central America, for example, future victims in certain rituals have the privilege or obligation to commit certain transgressions, sexual or, or otherwise, during the interval of time between their selection and immolation. I immediately thought of celebrities. Celebrities are precisely this. They are scapegoats that have been selected that they haven't necessarily been sacrificed yet. Maybe not all of them, but we do know a phenomenon of, of, of celebrities being sacrificed. 
But also we know the phenomenon of celebrities being allowed to transgress, that we enjoy watching them transgress as if we're looking at the lives of the rich and famous. Look how extreme their lives is. Look how many uh, women, drugs and fast cars and rock star lives they have. But they are nothing but scapegoats in waiting and their sacredness and the sacredness of their power. Think of Elvis, of Cobain and of so many others who mimic that. The sacredness in their case comes simply from this sacrificial foreplay. It's like they just haven't been killed yet. And that's why we love them because we there's but there's a transference happening. We're putting all the sins of the group into them by allowing them to transgress. Yo, sin for all of us so that we can then kill you and feel better for you afterwards. Yeah, that's exactly right. And that's why, why some some rock stars and some you know artists and and so they can get away, they get away with it, right? So they've been they've been kind of you know been, been very transgressive all, all their lives, and they they are they are being uh, uh, they're being celebrated for it. But but often also rock stars they get uh, or or you know, famous people or people who are who are in the limelight they often often also get scapegoated for their for their transgressions, right? And so and sometimes they are they are celebrated for what they did in one decade, and then a decade later, so the society has shifted somewhat. And suddenly they are vilified, right? There are many, many uh, examples of that. And I think that uh, I think Daniel, you are exactly right. So I mean, this is basically a typical uh, um, uh, sacred kingship, right? What we are seeing in this in this uh, uh, this this culture of celebrities. These are forms of kings, and 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 this also shows that it's it's very there's something pathological about wanting to be a king, because wanting to be a king that means that you are you you run so you you basically want to do things that are not not allowed for ordinary people but you run the serious risk of being killed that's basically that's basically what you're playing at when you try to be, become one of those one of those kings that connects me to something else as Gerard says on page 73 <laughs> but the imperative of ritual forces no sorry but the imperative of ritual forces the members of the, these same groups out beyond the group domain in search of victims. You don't know celebrities. They're out there in the pantheon. They're outside. The foundations of human culture, particularly the modes of matrimonial exchange, for example, the initial economic exchanges, etc., are built on the ritual of sacrifice. What I want to point out here is that the reason why we why celebrities are seen as this outside entity like a saint is because human institution almost forces us to seek blood outside um meaning when you look at a celebrity and when you when you attribute to it all these qualities you secretly expect it to die you're secretly bloodthirsty for its death you want to see it rise a lot so that its fall can be all the more powerful and so we are all guilty of this collective murder of every celebrity we wish to see fall. And so we are all also very bloodthirsty for that. So behind every rock star that dies, there is a bloodthirsty crowd. I think there's actually a good example of this type of thing that happened recently with uh, the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson, who was enjoyed <laughs> precisely for being a transgressor being a bit of a party boy he didn't play by the same rules as everybody else and then it comes out that well during the covid lockdown what happened well he was partying he wasn't playing by the same rules as everybody else and so the media swung its axe and killed him so the very thing that was enjoyed then became the very same thing that led to the execution yeah and then the good thing with our with our current society so this is one of the, the reasons why why western democracy kind of works is because we we don't literally kill them anymore <laughs> You know, this is one of the great things about about democracy that you can get rid of people without actually slaughtering them. And so, any system that makes it very difficult to to lift up people and remove them again is is a, a system that that runs the risk of um, of of increasing increasing violence, because this kind of like a boiling pot, right? So, because th th there are people there that 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 need to get rid of, and 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 the system doesn't allow it. So you have this. This is kind of like the you know, the pressure rises and rises and, until it explodes. While in democracy, you constantly have these small bubbles. But that's also why why democracy seems to be more unstable, right? It's it's a messy system where people arise and then they they get they get um, they get lifted up, they get uh, uh, idolized, and then they're suddenly pulled down again. But 
but that also takes a lot of uh, it, it takes a lot of pressure out of the out of the cooker, I think. Yeah. Thomas, can you check the connection in your mic quickly? It kind of keeps going loud and quiet a little bit. Um, yeah, there's not much mic actually. It's just my laptop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Um, I don't have. I don't have a very sophisticated setup today. Um, wait a moment. I, I might uh, be able to install to my the... other yeah. mic. Let's try that. If anything, you can go into the settings of the uh, audio preferences of Zoom and see it. Meanwhile, I want to suggest that we discuss the following. And this is where Gerard gets like deep and weird, and I think that's where we need to go into. He says the following radical thing, that the scapegoat is the mechanism of symbolic thought. He says, like, literally the guy who's interviewing him says, hey, Gerard, we know that the alpha and omega of everything is the surrogate victim in the mimetic process. Now, that's a big thing to say. It's much bigger to say this than to say that, yes, we replace kings once in a while and we kill celebrities once in a while because we're bloodthirsty, kinky motherfuckers. It's much bigger to say that the scapegoat is the mechanism of symbolic thought. And in the next chapter, chapter three, it will be the scapegoat mechanism as the origin of the process of harmonization. Now, this is much deeper, right? Because it says that behind every word that we agree on to exchange meaning is a primeval murder. So I, I wish, I mean, I, I would like to suggest that why don't we go there? Because it seems like there we will also encounter the relationship with, with, with Freud, first and foremost, with the death drive, with Hegel and Nietzsche. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll really get to, you know, beyond the cool examples of Girard, we'll get to like what it means for, for a modern understanding of, of things like the death drive. So to repeat... The scapegoat is the mechanism of symbolic thought. Yeah, so I think there's a chapter on that coming up, but we can kind of we can kind of talk about it. So basically, it's it's so animals they don't they don't uh, they're not prone to mimesis like humans, right? So they they don't copy each other's desires, so they don't get into the same types of conflict as as humans. When animals fight, they 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 fight for domination and stuff like that, but it's not so common that they kill each other. While humans they just uh, happily kill each other. So, so what Girard's point is that at some point in the transition from hum humans to from animals to humans, uh, three things arose at the same time, and that is first of all mimesis. So people started so the mimetic structure start, started happening, and the second thing is that that um, religion came about because you immediately needed uh, also the scapegoat mechanisms to appease the conflict in the tribe, which arises from the mimesis, right? So you need sacrificial religion and mimesis at the same time. And language at the same uh, also arises at the same time because language. So for Girard, the first word that was ever, ever uttered, that was the word that, des that designated the scapegoat. That one we're going to kill. So that would, that would basically be Girard's origin of language, as far as I understand. We'll, we'll get, go into more detail when we reach the chapter on humanization. But according to Girard, basically, the transition from, from, uh, from animals to human meant uh, mimetic structure. So we copy each other's desire. We kill people. We kill scapegoats to, uh, to get rid of conflict in the tribe. And we develop language because we designate a scapegoat with, 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 a, with, with the symbol, basically. So in all these, these three things, they 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 uh, they need to appear at the same time and this of course was this was not a magical occurrence this is something that 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 happened again and again in the course of evolution and in in many cases where these things didn't arise together the tribe just an annihilated itself right so many tribes probably um started going into mimetic rivalry and then just they basically just killed themselves right yeah wow I mean, my speculation would even be that it's in these early, very early rituals, and especially from the shift to like institutionalized ritual where something like um, poetry or sermon first gets developed precisely as the way of turning this instance of the thing into a copy of the thing that happens over and over again. The priest or whoever it is, the poet, the speaker, the singer has a certain song, a certain... Uh, speech 
whatever sort of primitive selection of sounds and probably instruments so as to bring people back to the memory of the previous times this has happened. And out of this, I'm guessing, would develop then uh, higher orders of abstractions. Eventually, the speech would get removed from the ritual itself, and then you end up with things like proto-philosophy. But this is where, so I think when uh, Daniel, you said Gerard is saying that uh, the mechanism is the origin of symbolic thought as such. I think that's precisely the way. It's through the language whereby whichever particular victim we have right in front of us today comes to be the same identity as the, the previous victim. And uh, ultimately the deity who is the symbol who connects them all and who stands for the pacifying effect as such. That would be Gerard's thesis. Fantastic. Let me, wow. Okay. If then even the symbolic institution, the institution of symbols and of, of you know, and the look in Lacanese, even if the symbolic order is like other institutions in that it is a religious and B in that it stems from the will to reproduce the reconciliatory mechanism, might we be speculatively able to suggest then a Girardian explanation for the death drive as the compulsive repetition of the same, of that compulsive repetition of, of the unconscious will to reconcile through murder. Because what is, uh, this is just speculation. I want to, I want to investigate this with you, but what, what, what is, what comes up for me is that this term drive in Girardian's, in Girardian terms, uh, seems to be explained by this will to basically reproduce time and again in culture and in symbols the reconciliatory mechanism but i think that there are probably many okay there, there are probably several things you could call death drive um so so for example the the so what you're what you seem to be getting at at here is that this this the general tendency of people to form mobs and, and go after scapegoats and kill them right are you calling that a death drive I don't know. There's many forms. I mean, of it, it's re it's reasonable. I mean, you could call that a death drive. I mean, it, there's hopefully this. There's when I say death drive, I'm, I'm I'm perhaps referring to the death drive of 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 Zizek and Zupancic. There are the yeah, that's, that's a bit so, so. I think that there are different ways in which you can you can fill that in. So first yeah. of all, you you have like you know the desire you know you form mobs and you kill scapegoats. You could call that a death drive, right? Yes. But there's also another death drive, and that is that this drive to self destruction or to run after things that that destroy you, right? That's that's or beyond the pleasure principle yeah so so this is i think the classical definition of that drive right so so in freud this is where 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 girard and freud disagree in a very interesting way so freud is brilliant because he saw that there's something weird going on so it's not just a pre pre pleasure principle sometimes people keep doing things that is not it's not pleasurable it actually destroys themselves and they keep doing it so and in order and, and freud freud brilliantly observed it described it and then he came up with, a, with, an obser with, an, with an explanation as well. And so G Girard thinks the observation is brilliant, but he doesn't agree with the explanation. So Freud posits a drive, the death drive, which is this drive to annihilation, this drive to self-destruction. And Girard says, that's wrong. Girard says that's another, another Platonism, another cultural Platonism. You kind of just posit something. It's just like that. People do that, you know. And, and Girard's explanation of the death drive is the following. So you know that we, we copy somebody else's desire, right? Mm -hmm. So you want what somebody else wants. Now, suppose that you, you are battling with somebody, let's say over a wife or a car or a position, whatever, and you get it, right? You, you actually win. What happens after some time, inevitably? You get bored. Yeah. You get bored. You're disappointed. You know, the woman is not as hot as you thought she was. She's actually very complicated and you fight all the time. The car, well, you know, nobody's impressed with it anymore after a couple of months. So you, you get bo you, you're bored. You're disappointed. <laughs> so you, what do you do? You find another model, right, that you can compete with and, and, comp and, and, and go after another object, right? And so you get that object again, and it's a bigger car. Or it's, a, you know, the, the wife has bigger fake, fake boobs or something like that. And what happens? then you get bored again right so what are you gonna gonna end up with ultimately you're gonna end up trying to maximally repeat the reconciliatory murder like get a bigger 
dose of whatever it is you yeah, chase well, you, until you, it destroys you, you. you. First, so you you're going to go into repetition. You're going to go, you're going to repeat this pattern, like finding something to to go after. Then but because you know, you because ultimately you know that getting the object is disappointing. So you're going to say like, well, I didn't go for the right objects. So you're going to end up with finding a model that does not allow you to win. And you're going to break your back on it. You're going to break your teeth on it. So you're going to find something that does not allow you to get the object. And that's for Girard to death drive. And if that's for so Girard, that's the difference that's between right. Freud and, and Girard. So, for, so in Girard, there's a, there's a mechanism that explains what's going on. And, and Freud posits a... a a fundamental drive that pushes people there. And, and is I where I become slightly skeptical whether Gerard has got it completely right, because I'm not sure his account of the this mechanism of the repetition can completely satisfyingly explain some of the weird ticks and repetitions that people get into. Like, for example, like <laughs> Zizek's compulsive scratching of his face or someone's... Um, neurotic repetition of rituals around washing their hands or something these strange rituals that they compulsively do that have a kind of um i guess the lacanians would say a surplus enjoyment to them um i don't know if that because that doesn't seem like it's chasing after an object that you can't ever get so much as it's just a a strange part way of moving the body that uh, i guess the Freudian school or the Lacanian school would say has been inscribed in the unconscious in a peculiar way. And here's, you know, I have to take a sense of humility here. I don't exactly fucking, I, I haven't resolved this in myself at all, but I kind of see this. I'm not satisfied with Gerard's explanation for how some of these symptoms can arise. I, I want to say that <clears throat> Gerard, one of the things that Gerard does really attractively is that he doesn't positivize the unconscious as if there was something there and as if it was a place where something can be inscribed in but rather it's just the drive you have no understanding of it comes from the real and it just happens so that's just tick number one tick number two is doesn't this idea that uh you know doesn't this make christianity the ultimate death drive cult according to both gerard and nietzsche Religion has collective. <laughs> it's, <got a> jump. <laughs> yeah, it's a jump, but I mean, Gerard is a Christian. But my point is, my God, then then Christianity or any other religion is the is the place you go to in order to break your back and break your teeth, so that you don't have anything else to to fight with because you've just lost, and in that loss you become. I mean, Islam means submission. The priests were black. It is precisely a, a, a tremendously sadomasochistic situation that you have there at the end of the road of your desire so my point here is is again what happens when your surplus enjoyment becomes uh, spent when you've spent the chase uh you know in this search for repeating the reconciliatory murder and if that assuming that that is the death drive according to gerard then, then what happens is because you cannot, I mean, either you kill someone or you revert that back onto yourself and you go do penance. That's, that's why all the dudes in prison become Christian. Because it's like, oh, I can't kill anybody else to just outsource my, my death drive, literally the death drive as killing instinct. Uh, so I'll just turn that back into myself, find the stone I cannot lift, become mega Christian. And that's where you'll find my surplus in German. Okay, That's I think now understand. it's high time that we bring in in uh, a prohibition, right? Because now, now this is this is basically the the difference between a Girardian view of religion and uh, and the, and the Nietzschean view on religion, especially Christianity, right? So Nietzsche would say like, oh, Christianity, there's a bunch of smart priests who uh, who use the pro who use the resentment of the slaves to to uh, to gain personal power, right? So these stories, that's kind of Nietzsche, right? But, but for Girard, religion in general, not just Christianity, but any, any, uh, any religion, is very, much, um, is very much concerned with prohibition. So, but, so if, if, if humans are mimetic, right? And if copying each other's desires leads to competition and competition leads to conflict and conflict leads to, leads to 
um, let's say, conflict on an enormous scale, which ends up in the annihilation of the tribes, so things that we've seen in, in, in Rwanda and, and in other in other um, in other historical situations, right, where where you have like these these um, uh, these these peoples that, that that turn against themselves and 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 destroy themselves. So so what what religion tries to do is religion religion tries to curb mimesis. So it tries to it tries to limit competition over things that will create um, rivalry, and that is of course things like food, things like uh, women. Um, property, all of these things, they will be they will be regulated by pro by religious prohibitions. So, for example, women, right? Normally, they, 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 how you uh, how you uh, behave around women, this is strongly prescribed by religious taboos and religious structures, right? So, but then there's a problem. Okay, so if you have a religion to make sure that people don't go into rivalry. So that they don't, they don't, that people don't go into tribe, uh, tribal conflict and then annihilate themselves. Okay, but then how are you going to make sure that people actually don't go into complete stasis, right? If nobody's allowed to 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 be around, if men are not allowed to be around women, how do you how do you get marriage done? How do you get procreation done? How do you get sexuality done? So, and then then you understand that people live in two times. So you live in times of prohibition, but then when you, for example, need to go into sexuality or marriage or exchange of goods or anything like that, things that are normally prescribed um, uh, or associated with prohibition, then you need to go into the ritual time, ritual space, where everything that is not allowed in ordinary time is suddenly allowed in ritual time. And that is why... And that's one of the, the big points of this uh, of this uh, chapter. That's why all of these important things, all of these important institutions like <clears throat> marriage, which has something to do with sexuality, the exchange of goods, growing up, you know, going from child to to uh, to to um, to woman or man, education, all of these things are associated with ritual space. Why? Because they're dangerous. Education is very dangerous because. You, some, you suddenly, there's somebody who instructs somebody else so that, that the pupil becomes a master. And that means that this, this former pupil who becomes a master can go into competition with the, with the previous master. So all of these things are, are strongly associated with prohibition and with, and with ritual. And humans need to learn to live in these two times. You, you live in times of prohibition most of the time, and then you, you live in times of ritual where you where you transgress, where you do things that are normally not allowed, and these ritual times, they are always associated, at least archaically, always associated with slaughter, with killing scapegoats. In the beginning of humans, later of animals, and even later, like now, we don't even know anymore that it is associated, that it has its origins in in the sacred. Um, competition at an enormous scale, which happens in huge societies. Uh, in order to prevent rivalry is dealt with, as you say, via rituals such as, I mean, there's many rituals, right? But what happens is, is that in order to deal with the, this competition at an, an enormous scale, my hypothesis is that we internalize it at an enormous scale in order to prevent, you know, every offense made to you uh, from becoming something that you escalate. This internalization seems to me to be very connected to our somehow enjoyment to a surplus enjoyment because you see what happens when with this internalization at an enormous scale is that in turn in order to prevent that from somehow reaching some sort of boiling point uh, the surplus of this internalization is religion I don't know if it's religion, but I do think like this is Freud's like and institution like, outlined like in civilization and discontents, right? That's kind of the idea we're getting to here. And this was another of my thoughts going through in my chapter that I'm uh, I don't think Girard investigates this theory um, deeply enough. So where I started thinking about this was the passage about um, about the prohibition on incest and uh, and Freud's theory of the Oedipus complex, where Gerard, I think if I understand his critique right, he said we don't need some platonic idea of an Oedipus complex to explain there being a taboo 
on sexuality, say, with your mother or with your sister. All we need is a theory about how sexuality in, like that exists amongst humans in the nearest and dearest members of a family or a tribe. They need some kind of prohibition on mothers, on sisters, so as to function. And that's uh, and that's just simply the origin of the thing that Freud's pointing to in the Oedipus complex. What I don't see Gerard do here is investigate what might be the psychic consequences of this prohibition existing, which I think is what Freud is influenced. I think, and this might be connected to something that I've heard you say, uh, Thomas, previously, that for a lot of Girard's younger years, he thought it was possible to exist in the position outside of desire. And it was only late in his, in his life that he started to reckon we have to maybe be in desire. I think there's just a theory I was playing with today that maybe Girard is assuming that the prohibitions kind of just function and it doesn't produce a kind of psychic surplus or psychic pressure yes. of the sort that Freud is theorizing in civilization is discontent, which then plays out in strange neurotic symptoms. Now, of course, there is ritual time as the time when uh, when the pressure is lifted, when the prohibitions are lifted, but we still have to deal in uh, normal time, in pro prohibited time with the fact that even if there's a strong cultural taboo, for example, on fucking the nearest women to us, there is still a sexual desire there. There is still the possibility of sexuality there. And so there is some kind of tension. I think yeah, no, no. Gerard, Gerard has actually written a lot about that, right? So, and so basically what Girard says is that Freud's idea is that the Oedipus complex is again a platonic thing, right? This is something that is, that is uh, okay, so it's the, the mother is inherently attractive to the child, right? To the son, basically, right? The son gets attracted to the mother and then therefore goes into conflict with the father. This fundamental structure that happens during, during, the, um, during uh, growing up is then projected all over the place right yeah. this is kind of like it's like a kind of an imprint that is then projected all over the place now girard is different in the sense that first of all normally this doesn't happen normally this this oedipus complex in a healthy family the or let's say in a, in a not healthy but let's say like in a in a in a in a deep religious structure there are so many taboos and regulations and the whole tribe is so so concerned with avoiding situations of rivalry that, that people are just prevented from going there. So the occurrence of the Oedipus complex is already a sign of the disappearance of religious prohibition. It's a sign of breakdown of religious structure. Because normally these types of interactions are strongly, strongly tabooed. Anything that creates rivalry is strongly, strongly tabooed. That's, that's the first thing. The second thing, and this is also important, that is that there's some kind of fetishism going on because according to Freud, the mother is inherently attractive to the child, right? While in Girard's, uh, in Girard's view, it's actually, it's actually the, the, the mother is attractive to the son because the mother is attractive, to, is, is attractive to the father. So it's the desire of the father that is copied by the son. So there's nothing inherent about the mother that is attractive. So again, Girard always thinks about triangles, while people like Marx and Freud, they think about objects that are inherently attractive. And this is the very big, big, uh, the, a very big difference. So again, this could be called cultural Platonism. You could call that fetishism. It's as if these objects are attractive in themselves. They have something that attracts something, something mysterious. While Girard would say, well, not really. Things are attractive because other people are, find them attractive because you copied their desire. So, so that, these, are, these are some of the differences. But then even, so here's interesting, even if Girard's view of, say, the triad of child, father, mother is uh, what produces this, um, this potential desire, which does seem to play out in the speech of kids, like my little brother used to tell my mom he wanted to marry her all the time. I think this is quite a common thing. Um, even then, the very fact of that, if it's a triangle that is strongly, strongly, strongly tabooed and prohibited by culture, um, I guess the psychoanalytic hypothesis would be this could still produce some kind of psychic blockage that is then going to play out in neurosis. Yeah, internalization still works. What I agree with Gerard here is that that internalization doesn't mean that there's an inherent essence in the unconscious that just leads to this. What he tries to, I, what, what I like about him is that he makes this some somehow a processual point. And the, the, the vectors of this process to me include internalization. 
So to me, the point at which Gerard and Freud's death drive might overlap is around this idea of enjoying the surplus, meaning that you enjoy being the scapegoat, being scapegoated maybe lightly, being the butt of a joke. You enjoy being denied pleasure and made fun of. It, it, in, in summary, you enjoy, you enjoy the surplus of this internalization of mimetic conflict. And why is there so much mimetic conflict? Well, because we live in large societies and competition occurs at an enormous scale and we're not going to win all the time. So the first step, the first ritual step is a meditation step is like you have to get a hold of yourself and you have to be like, okay, I'm going to be, I'm going to like take this one. I'm going to de get defeated on this one. But that internalization creates, an, a, creates a surplus. That surplus, I, I would say, is Gerard's account of the death drive. Uh, when enjoyed. When enjoyed. And then I hear... Uh, Why is it called a surplus? Surplus because it's... it's it's the excess. So first, you, you know, there's competition, you win. I, I, I come, I, I take a step back and you win. So I somehow internalize. I have to, I have to make amends with this uh, transition of desire. I desired something, then I got defeated, then I internalize it. There needs to be some sort of, th this step is a transmutation of desire somehow. Uh, but that I would, I would imagine produces some sort of surplus, uh, which is, the internal enjoying the internalization as such so my god i got defeated but what if i really enjoy defeat that would be yeah the, but, but, the but that's that's what, what 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 you're not describing is um it's, it's like pseudo narcissism yes and, and no, no, no sorry sorry not narcissism pseudo masochism masochism exactly because, and, and because because this is also related to the death drive it's kind of like um yes so so here you so if what you're talking about is is that well if if you put yourself in a position where you're laughed at or humiliated and stuff, so indeed this is very pleasurable for for some people um and why is that pleasurable well 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 you're actually close to something that is very valuable because it's the person that humiliates you the person that dominates you has that mysterious object that everybody wants that's what the pseudo masochist is after that's why why it looks like it looks like it's pain and humiliation that go off that people go after, but that's not really the point. That's the way it looks like to people outside. From the inside, it's like, well, yes, I get pain and humiliation, but the price that I get for it is that I can be close to a very powerful model that has the pot of gold. And that that's, pot of gold, the, yeah, that pot of gold doesn't exist. You know, while it, exist, may have, no. while it may exist, have existed, no. while it may have existed, perhaps in the beginning, because we double and double and double and double and double, all of a sudden, mimetic conflict exists without having any view of the original pot of gold that generated the original conflict. Right? That's what Gerard says. You get into fight about a woman, but then all of a sudden, the whole tribe is in a fight, and everybody's forgotten about the woman. You just like have the fight, and you just mimic that. So you're you're chasing this displaced virtual object, this object ptia which is, is precisely what it is. This is, again, to, to bring Lacan into the mix. And that is the object that you strive for. And that is precisely why you enjoy the distance to that object. Because you enjoy the surplus that has come from the grade one, two, three, four, five defeats that you've suffered according to this. And the surplus is precisely what you enjoy. And might, maybe that has something to do with the overlap between Freudian, Lacanian, and Girardian death drives. And it sounds hot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit rusty on my Lacanian stuff, but the, the surplus jouissance or the... Oh, and you, do you have a, a good explanation for that? Uh, that would be interesting. I mean, I think it, it's... It's this sense that it's a... Um, a compulsive repetition of something that... It, it just is that compulsive repetition of something that's beyond pleasure but there is a kind of perverse pleasure in it so for example like that example of the going into a masochistic ritual is a good explanation of it i think if somebody's got a kink for that that would be my understanding of it. but it could also be the um the compulsive repetition of the hand washing ritual of the obsessive neurotic or the compulsive repetition of uh a, a, a thought pattern or whatever or a, or an addiction like a super a, a destructive addiction Think of Catholic saints and the imagery of Catholic saints being usually all bloody. <clears throat> Saint Bartholomew doesn't have a skin. Saint, I think, is Agatha, has her tits being cut from her breast and so on. So um, 
you enjoy this. We enjoy this. This is bloodthirsty. This is the bloodthirst. This is searching the, for the for the victim outside. This has all to do that for me. This the, the connection between Girard and, and what, the Latinian school. What's interesting, I think the description that Thomas just gave about pseudo masochism to me seems quite convincing. That makes sense as a reason why someone would be in joy in that position precisely because they're being next to someone who has the absolute power. What I still struggle with understanding is what is the mechanism that would mean that some people want to be in the masochistic position and some people want to be in the sadistic position. Ah, they need each other, right? Right. But why do they, why does one subject go for one and one to go for the other? Ah, but that's, that's, uh, that's, that's, well, often people just get, I think that people kind of get, get stuck in a rut. And I think that's where Lacanian jouissance really comes into, right? So because if you're creative with it, then adopting a pseudo-masochistic stance or or uh, or the, the the stance of the guru or the or the uh, or the all of these things. And so if if you do that in in an artful way, then then it's an it's an uh, it's an uh, an adornment, as a, as Trumpa would say, right? It's a it's a beautiful thing. It's a jewel. But of course, if you kind of if you kind of reify it. You know, you start living like that and you can't get out of it. It becomes a rut. Then it hurts. Right. I mean, if you constantly find yourself surrounded, you know, starting relationship with people who mistreat you and, and who make your life very, very miserable because you, you get this pseudo masochistic kick. Um, that is, of course, that is then you, you feel I think that is what Jewish songs is right. The 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 the. the the reward that you get from being a, a, around this powerful mobile is 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 not worth all the pain right it, it's the jouissance right there's something like really destructive uh, ugly dirty unfunctional about it and uh, and and that that happens when you start reifying these things and when when it becomes it's an unconscious you're not aware what you're doing and and it's it's just it's kind of like an addiction that takes over right sure but for me the Girardian system doesn't satisfyingly explain precisely why someone would get stuck in that rut and not go to another rut the moment well, another why, rut. Why? I mean, that's just like, I mean, why do you, I mean, why do you wear the clothes that you're, you, you're wearing or why, why do you, why do you pick a certain subculture? I mean, there's a certain random aspect to it, right? Uh, I, I don't know. I, that, well, I, I think that's the thing that maybe it's random or I, again, the psychoanalytic hypothesis would be that it's not random. That it's connected. Uh, 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 to... okay. the, the psychoanalytic hypothesis sort of essentializes the reason why choices are made. I would make a much more practical, processual, maybe Girardian point here. I think to say that the thing is essentialized is a misreading of the psychoanalytic hypothesis, which is to say that there's an investment cost to it. There's an energetic investment cost to it. You learn to enjoy it for a little bit on this little style, kink, whatever. And then you exhaust the jouissance that it can... Uh, produce as an excess yeah. and then you come to the next one right but if everything was just mimetic then you'd go and find something else you would no, no. You, you go and you find you find something else and then you are either defeated and you learn to enjoy the loss or you win and you learn to enjoy the other's loss and, and you but the the fact that you find an enjoyment means that it's more worthwhile to stay with this manifestation than with the other one and that's the investment uh, cost thing. That's why, you know, you, you make friends in a certain subculture in a certain style and not in another one. Because this one just like fulfills your itch, scratches your itch way better. And it's really hard to start a new one. So obviously it's just like the basic yeah, behavior. Yeah, yeah. You know? I don't really understand what, what, what uh, I mean, trying to understand what your, what your problem is, uh, Owen, or what, what you want to, to have solved here. Because people, they, they keep doing things, right? because it gives them a certain satisfaction let's say the pleasure is more than the pain right yeah but at some point stuff breaks down and that's when people end up a therapist right when the usual shtick doesn't work anymore and then they get some help they get a new new view and then they walk off and they start doing something else so that's usually what happens and of course what your upbringing how you know where you grew up your friends your parents how they treated you that history that certainly has an has a has a, an effect on you, and I think that Girard is indeed criticized for for not really exploring that side, you know, the historical side of a human being very much. I think that Freud puts a lot more emphasis there. So I I think if that's maybe if if I understand correctly, that might be your your beef a bit with, with Girard that you would like to have a bit more 
uh, attention for the historical reasons why people end up with in certain in certain situations with respect to mimesis why is somebody a pseudo masochist why does somebody become a narcissist why does somebody become a sadist all of these things these are extremes but we we everybody adopts these types of stances almost you basically go through all these different stances um uh, throughout throughout your uh throughout your existence right? to corroborate this no. to corroborate this i'm going to quote gerard he says that the most humble is linked to the most exalted in the sacrificed and also in this that we're talking about a trace of subjection and domination and vice versa and here like i turn two pages back in my notebook and i arrive at something that i took a note down with nietzsche that you need to obey the command to command and in obeying you also command so there's an incredible twisted and messed relationship between commanding obeying creating the stone you cannot lift and so on uh my god i would even argue that nietzsche is just literally just creating the stone he cannot lift because his his, his, his will yeah, is the overman that's the overman is the stone you cannot lift it by definition <laughs> by definition it is a stone that can only emerge and he says this himself once man is overcome so it's there it's an object ti and the object ti is precisely uh, the surplus of all the of all the def mimetic defeats and so it is precisely something that you cannot reach that's it that's where you break your back and your teeth in. and that's perhaps something about the death drive but but owen to your point i just wanted to to mention this that the most humble is linked to the most exalted a trace of subjection in domination and vice versa so there's a there's a twisted thing here uh to speak about this com commutative property that you refer to, right? Why, why do you enjoy this kink and not that one? Why doesn't it switch? Well, because in this weird way, they're already present in each other, um, either embodied or, or, or desired. You know, the, the, the dominant... But, they, they, but they, I would argue that they do switch. I mean, people are, are adopting submissive stances, uh, dominant stances all Absolutely. the time. I mean, they, they, during the day, they go from one stance to the other. It's like one big mess. Yeah. So and and uh, and um, so so uh, and and it basically also depends on on on. So you walk around and you randomly pick up desires from others, right? Yeah. You're in a network. You're in a pool of 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 desires, and you you can randomly pick up stuff. And now it's not only from people around you or from television, but it's also from you know the biggest mimetic machine ever designed, social media. So people pick desires up all of the time through through digital means, and but that's of course where it comes from. So there's a big there's a big random component about it. So who are you who are you hanging so yeah, yeah, like yeah. who are you hanging out with? But of course, uh, uh, in addition to the random component which you must submit to, there is also a steering designing component that you have also have access to. Uh, I would argue, and that component has to do with choosing what you submit to. It's not like you can decide now I will desire this, but it's much easier to choose. Well, I will, I will not pay attention to this thing and this thing and this thing because it throws me off the way in the style that I like to enjoy. And I will choose to copy this and this and that and the other, because I just, you know, that that's flowing well with me. And so it's not like you have commanding and obeying, but you have obeying indiscriminately and the choice of what you obey. And I think those are the two the two buttons that people can can press within this Girardian framework. Sure, yeah, well, that's I mean, what pe what people have been doing in religion, right? They pick religious religious models. You know, yeah. I'm gonna follow I'm gonna follow Jesus. I'm gonna fo follow uh, uh, Muhammad. I'm gonna follow Buddha, and 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 those those those. Um, those figures to follow those re religious uh, those religious figures they 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 typically serve to to um, to limit mimetic desire and 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 mimetic rivalry. That's that's one of the purposes of religion. And and in the case of of the of the the, the post pagan religions like Buddhism and Hinduism and and Judaism, Christianity and Islam, they are also very strongly against sacrificial sacrificial uh, religions. So they are against the the, the 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 scapegoat mechanism. My God, sovereignty and sacrifice are inextricably linked, and I cannot help but to think about the concept of self-sacrifice uh, for the sake of sovereignty versus indiscriminate mimesis and therefore less of loss of sovereignty. 
Do you know what I mean? Um, if you pick your sacrifices, that is a form of being sovereign. I'm talking in, a, in an absolute self-centered perspective. Uh, if you don't, mm, then you're sacrificing sovereignty and therefore being completely submissive. There's a strange, there's a strange dialectical play here that I'm just intuiting that I'm not really formulating properly, but but it plays out in religion. It plays out in, in sort of embodied desire and historical desire as well, like the historical desire of my body and so on. Yeah. I felt like I've reached the stone I cannot lift with this. <laughs> <laughs> I ran out of breath. Let me take a Marvelous. Well, I, I, in that case, I'll, I'll go back just to kind of uh, touch on what Thomas said about five minutes ago. I think you're right. I think about the historical uh, versus mimetic thing. I think maybe that you kind of nailed it quite nicely, what I've been trying to point to. And uh, no, I, I think it's fascinating, like I said before we started this, to see how Gerard is wrestling with Freud. Mm -hmm. And there's something, you know, and I think the the conversation that we're having is connected to that um, going beyond Gerard in the sense of actually having ritual space and having tantric space in the conversation that we've had uh, in around the uh, the IDW and other spaces, right? There's something in Gerard that, at least initially. He's going for the okay. We can just have prohibition. We can we can reveal the scapegoat mechanism, and then we don't need to do ritual anymore. We don't need to have scapegoating ritual anymore. Prohibitions will work. And I think there's there's an investigation precisely into the ruts that people get stuck in, as you said, that then turn into adornments, like in that Trumperesque sense. That I think. Gerard doesn't think deeply enough, which is why then adding guys like Nietzsche to Gerard is interesting and productive, but also returning to Freud through Gerard. And that, that's kind of, I guess, where my thinking is at, basically, rather than trying to get it, like I'm not trying to get rid of Gerard or anything. I think Gerard, it, it's a fascinating way to even think. I think probably um, going back to the Oedipus complex, right? Freud might even enjoy Gerard saying, no, I think I've sold it. You don't need to posit this, this essence so much as there's actually a mechanism for it. Freud was constantly saying in his writings, I'm not sure I've nailed this. I'm just observing this. And even like with yeah, the death yeah. drive, if you read like Beyond the Pleasure Principle, Freud is, he's so tentative about even suggesting this thing. He's so uncertain that the thing he's naming is even a thing. But yeah, there was no, nobody's nobody scapegoating Freud here. I mean, and I, I think that Girard often often kind of points out, you know, Freud is is wrong on this, uh, in the, in in on this matter exactly because his thinking is very close to Freud, so he needs to differentiate himself and kind of kind of kind of make sure, like you know, he, this is where it's different. And of course, Girard has a lot of of. Um, um, he calls it genetic thinking, which I think is a bit of an, <laughs> an uh, un unfortunate word choice. Um, but but he's very interested with respect to um, with respect to the historical, um, the, with respect to homonization. So where do all these things come from? And Freud was also interested in that, um, and and he came also up with uh, with uh, primordial slaughter, right? That was in uh, I think Totem and Taboo, right? That is about the the murder of the of the primordial father right of the, the the father of the hurt or something like that but but and and that is also similar to the homogenization theory of girard right it's killing the scapegoat right but there are very important differences so it's again freud you know there's this beautiful uh, expression from the bible seeing through a glass darkly right you 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 see stuff and it's but it's unclear the glass is a bit too too turbid right and and i think that's what you can say about freud and about nietzsche that they saw a lot of things that nobody's ever seen before. So uh, uh, Nietzsche knew that Dionysus and 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 uh, and Christ were different. They're both slaughtered, but they're actually they're actually mirror images of each other. Freud, uh, Nietzsche understood that. Freud understood uh, things such as that that some somehow primordial murder is important for culture. That culture is a tomb, which is what what Girard says. So those ideas were in Freud. But I think that it's like like Girard looks at Nietzsche, looks at, at Freud and kind of like puts the cherry on the on the cake, right? And 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 uh, 
and clarifies a lot of things. And I agree with you, Owen, that Girard doesn't really consider the, 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 the possibility that, first of all, ritual is necessary. And that second of all, ritual without scapegoating is possible. And I think this is what we see in, uh, in, for example, in Buddhism, where we have the sut where we have sutra versus tantra. Sutra would correspond roughly to prohibition, ordinary time, right? This is the, the time of prohibition, the time of limiting mimesis, limiting competition, limiting rivalry. And then you have the the the, the other time, the ritual time, which corresponds to tantra, where you break a lot of the prohibitions to go into into dangerous spaces, where you have undifferentiation where you have um, a change of, of identity temporarily uh, and, and all of the, and these things can be. So I think that what Nietzsche, what Nietzsche is concerned about, right? He, I think that he was, he was saying that people cannot live without this Dionysian energy, without this ritual space. And, uh, but the error that he made is that he thought we can live in it. And you can't. No, I you disagree. Live in it. I don't think that's what Nietzsche says. I, mis I, I read Nietzsche in a different way. In page 77 right, of Thus Speaks it. Yeah, let's have it. In page 77 of Thus Speaks Zarathustra, Nietzsche said that a quiet bloodthirst envelops the public spaces. In many ways, my conclusion of, of, of reading him, especially when he refers to, to uh, the fact that behind these priests dressed in black uh, and underneath them, underneath the rocks that they stand on, there is a corpse that smells. Nietzsche says this, right? He understands that the shape is shaped, the state is shaped like a death drive. I think Zarathustra absolutely and completely understands that he doesn't want to, like the opposition, this, this opposition, this is a misrecognition that on one hand you have, let's just go uh, 200 miles per hour on the freeway with no brakes and uh, Nietzsche. And then on the other hand, you have the Christian Sutric Girardian mainstream. Oh my God, let's all be pious. And that's a false opposition. Even Nietzsche sought to submit to something. He just wanted to formulate and to submit to something uh, to the most high in his own terms. So it's not a matter, again, I'll repeat, it's not a matter of complete submission to law and renunciation versus the complete unleashing of the overman desire. No, it's a matter of picking your submission either to banal law in a sutric mainstream sense or to the absolute overman, to the limits of your own personal desire. And that's where I think Nietzsche is a little bit more ethical. The stone that you cannot lift, but which you can't, we, you must formulate yourself in this Nietzschean sense. That's why the achievement of the overman, that's what it accomplishes. It accomplishes the formulation of this one stone that nobody can lift, that can only be reached once man is overcome, which is basically an afterlife doctrine, which is basically why Zarathustra positivizes the death drive he positivizes his as as the overman and that's what he places at the crown where he breaks his back and, and smashes his teeth in and i think that that's a big difference that's the dialectical resolution of this uh, all in and all out um, i think it's 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 both times you're all out because you can't because life has limits you just have to pick which one and i think what zarathustra does with his all out is to basically do it in his own terms and he pays his own price and perhaps has a, a different relationship to that desire is my point of view. But Zarathustra absolutely, and Nietzsche absolutely understood, like many, oftentimes reading Nietzsche, I, I read Gerard already. He knows culture is a tomb. He knows there's murder underneath it. He knows people don't, don't aren't, aren't brave enough to go there, but he is, and he understands precisely this, this murderous, undertone of of culture but I, I think that Nietzsche is um, I mean the problem with Nietzsche is that you can I mean he writes one thing and and somewhere else he writes another thing right so he's one there's a lot of contradictions in Nietzsche and paradox and poetry and and uh, provocations but my take on Nietzsche is that this is uh, this is a note from the underground right Nietzsche writes from the breakdown of prohibition around him. It was in a society where, relig where religious prohibition was breaking down. And this was a man who was in the midst of mimetic rivalry, mimetic desire, and he wrote from that hell. Nietzsche is a message from hell, basically. That's the way that I read, read Nietzsche. Just like, you know, like, uh, you know, it reminds me of Casanova. You know, you don't write, read Casanova because he's so because he's he, he's a brilliant thinker, right? You read Casanova because he gives an he gives a great um, 
a, a great description of what life was in, in that period, right? And I read Nietzsche because Nietzsche is an account of what happened in the 19th century and what would, would degenerate into World War I and World War, World War II. That's how I read Nietzsche. Nietzsche is basically, a, basically Nietzsche is somebody who describes what's going on. It's not such a, you know, I wouldn't really turn him into a systematic thinker like what Heidegger tried to do that, which I think is preposterous. Oh, no, he's not a systematic. Nietzsche is a a psychologist who describes his own turmoil, basically. He's certainly not a metaphysicist. And in that, and in that, he's also an ethical hero, ethical towards his own desire. He's a self. What own desire? This is the big. This is the big problem with Nietzsche, right? He says, like, well, you know, the overman and, and and discover your own desire. This is pure romantic notion, right? Is the romantic notion that you know sit down and inquire what your own desire is that's just not going to happen if you do that finding your own desire you'll just find the desire that you picked up from somebody else Nietzsche's anthropology is completely wrong and this is why why if you take Nietzsche's Zarathustra as, as one of, as your bible right which is why he wrote it this is why Zarathustra is a pastiche of the bible right he wrote it because Nietzsche's desire was to be like Jesus yeah. He wanted to be a religious figure that everybody followed. And it actually worked. Like, you know, how many teenagers treat Zoratustra and all this bravura and no, this no, hyperbole? I'll, I'll give you, you know, that. That's what's going that's on with Nietzsche. Nietzsche. And that's why the so Nietzsche Nietzsche's anthropology is completely wrong. And it's that's why Nietzsche, follow, just following Nietzsche is like, you know, he has good, it's good studying Nietzsche is super rewarding. But, you know, if you take, take, if you take Nietzsche as, for granted as somebody who has wisdom, Right, that you can really like, you know, this person has reasoned about things that it's like. I think the interesting thing, right, is the degree to which there's so much in Nietzsche, but it's I think you've said this before, Thomas. I don't think this is my original point, but there's so much in it, but it's all jumbled up. And so what it has taken is a century plus of people taking different elements of it and trying to sift out, okay, what is the insight? That's you know. Freud actually didn't read Nietzsche. He actively tried not to, I think. But certainly, that's, the post- that's what he said. But the uh, yeah. the post Freudians have all been looking at how okay, well, like this is one trajectory. Gerard is also looking at Nietzsche and Freud. Like I, I the, the idea that popped into my head a second ago is that like Gerard is really nailing the anthropological insights that are there intuitively in Nietzsche, and they're also there intuitively in Freud. Then what you've got, say. Another strand of thought, which is kind of the post-Freudians, which is Lacan and then Zhupanchich Zizek, who are trying to nail the transformative aspects of Nietzsche, but do it in a way that gets beyond the 19th century romantic individualism. So then, Daniel, when you say the like thing about being ethical to your own desire, as if Nietzsche is some hero of that, I think it's a mistake to read that, to, to kind of read that in some kind of celebratory way. I think the way that a guy like Zizek means that is more being like, if you've got a kink, if you've got a rut, if you don't, if you don't give it some sort of space, you're going to end up in a kind of hell. If you don't have some kind of ritual time or some kind of way to work with it, if you've got some kind of addiction to a particular form of sexuality and you don't find a way to work through it or to enjoy it, it's just going to torture you. I think in the same way that nobody. And so it's like, it's a form of ethics, but it's not like uh, this is me and like my life should be oriented around this thing. Yeah. Like I, I, I love Nietzsche, but I think Nietzsche's concept of the overman, the most ridiculous concept in him. Like, I, th- I think well, nobody uh, reads Nietzsche as a role model, but like, if, if, I, I think a lot of people, a lot of people take, in the same take way, Nietzsche like, as, 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 uh, as Christ. If Nietzsche is no role physically. model, neither is Christ. Since yeah, both Christ is not a, well. Okay, there you well, go. Christ is, is not a role model. model. Is Christ, Christ a role model? A, Christ was a, okay. We're, we're we're getting ahead of ourselves because this is this is for a later chapter. But this is like the biggest misconception ever, right? How can Christ be a role model? He's a victim. Exactly. Yes. He was he was killed by a mob. And the whole point is that Christ did it for you. That's the whole good news. He did it for you. You don't have to do it. You can see what it is. That it's awful. Jesus went through it. Showed it. You don't have to follow Jesus. I mean, yes, Jesus as a as a an example to follow is that don't escalate things. I feel, you know, I feel turn like the other know. cheek, and which is good advice. You know, I mean, how do you survive in a job or in a relationship? You know, sometimes turn the other cheek, right? Not if they're hitting you with a hammer, but you know, 
don't escalate things. In that sense, you can you can take that you can take a message from Jesus. But Jesus is is a scape, he's the scapegoat who revealed what scapegoating is. Jesus is not an example to follow. He's he's so, he's, he's something completely different. He's an event that happened once speak, and for all. I want to speak That's towards a, the, yeah. this. I want to speak to the middle of this polarity Nietzsche Christ. Right? It, it's almost like Nietzsche by pastiche sought to suicide, sought a suicide by crowd. If Nietzsche is no role model, neither is Christ, since both represent an edge case of mimetic desire ran awry, brought to an extreme. But what both of them have in common is, uh, is the ethical fulfillment of, of whatever thing they desired by pastiche, by mimesis. You are absolutely correct. It's not, it's not that it was nature's desire or Christ's desire. No, there was a, a long lineage towards both the 19th century and the, the, the year zero, long lineage of prophets and, and history. That led to these characters emerging in this position. Uh, and they just existed, and, and by existing ethically to themselves, uh, they, were, they were killed. Uh, Christ by a mob, Nietzsche desired that to, to mimic because he wanted to be a little bit like Jesus, let's admit it. Uh, and that creates a new religion by means of your own sacrifice. The idea of the overman states this precisely. Of, of It is by man's overcoming that you will reach the overman. I feel like that's a both have this similar attitude towards desire which is which is maximally masochist somehow uh, but maximally masochist precisely because they understand that at the origin of all institutions is religion and at the origin of every religion is the fucking surrogate victim which they all sought to be do i make no, sense actually you know we, we can probably kind of reconcile things a bit by saying like well you know if christ revealed the scapegoat mechanism, you know, mobs find somebody to blame and then kill that person. That's a very nasty mechanism. Christ revealed that, that that whole shtick of, you know, the king is the scapegoat who is not killed yet. Yeah. The God, the divinity is the scapegoat who, who was killed. So they're both sides of the same coin, right? So if Christ yeah. revealed that, yeah. then we can actually ask. So and Christ is a revelation and not so much. A, an example to follow well, you don't need to have a, I, mean, I mean it's not as, as if a million Christ are going to solve the, the climate crisis right so that happened once and for all that's the good news right that, that it was done there so but then you can actually apply that to Nietzsche as well so if you don't take Nietzsche as somebody to follow but as somebody who reveals something that becomes interesting what is Nietzsche revealing exactly. and then I think that what is Nietzsche revealing is revealing is that a society that doesn't put the Dionysian or the ritual time in its place is, is a society that will end up with having so much ritual that it destroys itself. That there is a confusion between the, between the pro, times of prohibition and times of ritual. And I think that something like Nazism, right, is like a, a, a little fantasy of going back to we're going to live in exciting ritual times all of the time. We're just gonna we're gonna scapegoat like 24 hours a day and live in sacrificial time all of the time. So this is basically an attempt to to be in ritual space all of the time. So and I think that one of the of the big problems that we have now is that the the distinction between pro, times of prohibition and and times of ritual that's disappearing. Yes, absolutely. Do you want to hear why I think that's happening? Because there's an inflation of everyday sutra. In other words, um, we have come to learn to enjoy, you know, what, what does everyday sutra tell you? It tells you to turn the other cheek. It, it turns you to, it tells you internalize a little bit this excessive surplus competition that happens out there. And instead of like replying in the same token to everybody else turn the other cheek once in a while that's important that helps things move along nicely but the thing is that has kind of like become spent perhaps it has reached a critical point why because everybody's connected and so the whole thing has been exponentially increased like every other exponential curve in the last 200 years and so it seems like in order to allow ourselves to turn the other cheek uh, there's almost like the political movements or, or the political imperative for society to remain in work for us to enjoy being a scapegoat. But my God, to enjoy being a scapegoat, to enjoy, maybe being a scapegoat is too much, but to enjoy the turning of the other cheek, 
and to enjoy the internalization of competition, which then, you know, in the long pipe, in the long run might lead to enjoying being a scapegoat. That's supposed to be a ritual thing. That's not supposed to be a sutric thing. So it, it's, it's the traditional Girardian argument that says that, you know, the more you connect lots of people together with internet and the more people you have connected at the same time, the more rivalry in, in continues to, to emerge. And then it, it turns out to be, there's too much competition to mediate with ritual. Ritual doesn't work anymore. The meaning crisis is nothing but the effects of scale um, sort of crashing down on us, is what I would say. So, 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 so the lesson here has to do with, with new modes of enjoyment, because if the modes of enjoyment of, of a Christ lasted a long time for a specific technological paradigm, uh, what do the new technological paradigms mean for the division between Tantra and Sudra? I think that's the great disruption between liminal space and everyday space, ritual time and normal time. Does that make sense? Well, it reminds me again of civilization and its discontents, where the point there, I guess, is that turning the other cheek doesn't just come for free. Like turning the other cheek does involve renouncing some of your desire to get into a fight with the other person what we have lost i mean like how many people today spend even five minutes contemplating the idea of turning the other cheek consciously how many people spend one hour a week like in church on sunday contemplating the idea of turning the, the other cheek or something there's like remnants of little bits of prohibition and sutra everywhere but it's not consciously taught it's not consciously um practiced and so and so it's very weak it's very ineffective. There's a strain. Uh, and, and, and I think, I think, you know, one of the things that was fascinating when I was in the 12 step program is viewing it like 12 step is like pop-up religion, right? It, it's really fascinating how it works. You can create in a very, very intense sutra. All you need is a ritual space where people meet regularly and devote themselves to some kind of transcendental principle. And it works. All these people who have had a horrible, horrible self-destructive addictions now all of a sudden come and say, I put myself in service to a power higher than I am. And well, lo and behold, for a lot of them, the, the destructive behavior goes away while they remain within that structure. So something works operationally around having these, you might say, sutric spaces where people come to collectively just discuss and practice their prohibitions. But those spaces have disappeared, which is why something like 12 Steps became massive in the 20th century as a response to the, the breakdown of the church, for example, there's, it's, there's something fascinating about it. Uh, but it, it, when there isn't a, uh, I, I don't know if transcendental structure is the right word for it, but some kind of space where people come together to collectively, like I said, practice prohibition, but also reflect on there being something bigger than themselves, then the pain of having to turn the other cheek, of being a person inside civilization and being discontent becomes so overwhelming that it gets messy. And so the desires start to spill out. People start to um, resent the prohibitions or say, why should I turn the other cheek? Or say, or imagine that they do without ever really doing it, which is what a lot of the contemporary left has turned into. There's just a small note. You're 90% you're right. There's only the mistake of, of essentializing desire as a thing in and of itself that we want to live out as opposed to society forbidding us. There's also the, the mimetic component and the death drive component, like forbid me and I'll enjoy it 10 times as much is what happens oftentimes. So it's, there's the, there's, that's the death drive. Like you enjoy the, because it's forbidden, you enjoy it even more. Uh, so we need not to forget that and not to fall back into this simple dichotomy of a you know, I want to unleash my free desires versus a uh, big daddy comes to forbid me. And that's where it gets interesting. Well, that's the point of having a structured ritual space or a structured way to have an outlet for it. There's probably two types of ritual spaces then. One to, to, to just unleash the normal stuff and the other one to enjoy the prohibition. There's, there's some weird dialectics here. Yeah, sutric ritual and tantric ritual, I guess. Yeah, yeah. No, no, and there, there's I mean, tantric. So, so why do, I mean, if you look at, at what people are doing, right, so they, they are constantly looking for this um, sacrificial kick, but it's like a partial sacrificial kick, you know, go to a, you know, a, a, a big sport competition, you know, football match, 
um, going clubbing, you know, repetitive music, intoxication, um, uh, large crowds that are undifferentiated. This is all the sacred. This is all ritual. This is ritual time. So people are looking for ritual time all the time. But because this ritual time is not very intense, nobody's killed, right? So it becomes a bit of a not so much so functioning ritual time. So you're going to do into this repetition, right? You constantly look for this, 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 uh, this sacrificial kick. So that is that is something that um, that is going on now. But with respect to prohibition, you should not um, underestimate the enormous success of, of Christianity. That even people who are not Christians, or even as people, who, especially people who don't call them Christians, like you know, look at Dawkins. You know, they have this like elaborate system of of um, of um, of ethical principles that are basically Christian principles. So they would agree with like you know, mob killing scapegoats is an abomination. But this is a Christian idea. This is not an idea that comes from from science and rationality. This is something that comes from well, not only Christianity. I mean, but let's generalize it a bit. Otherwise, it becomes like a, you know, don't want to be accused of being like a, okay, uh, you know, okay. an a, apologist for one specific religion. I mean, the, the same idea is present in Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism. All these religions go away from you know. Let's not make mobs and slaughter. We go away from that. I know, right? but. So, so that is that is so pervasive now that even people who are not religious at all they have that religious structure in them. Very few people would say, "Oh, you know, well, regularly, um, you know, forming a mob and then finding some uh, poor scapegoat and then you know killing that person." I mean, you need a breakdown of society for that to uh, to make that happen again. I think we need to add really... another third leg to our dichotomies that we're working here. Otherwise, I think it's in insufficient. There is desire, there's prohibition, and there's prohibition of the prohibition. In the sense, I would say that Dawkins is more Christian than I am because his whole structure is about trying to prohibit the Christian prohibition. So my God, you're the most Christian guy I've ever met. Same thing with football. Recently in Portugal, they forbid people from having like these these uh, these these rockets in the in the stadium that makes like fire these flares. Uh, and the law came in That's and reasonable. What happens next week? Everybody's got flares. Like people didn't use flares too much. The moment they forbid the next week, everybody's got flares. You enjoy the transgression is my point. My point is that it's yeah, not. That, that, I agree with that. Those mechanisms can play out, right? Because ritual right? space is the play, space of a, a transgression. Yeah, that's what I point. What I try to say when there is the liberal, the, the free outgoing of desire. Uh, which, by the way, nothing kills desire more than its absolute free expression. There is its negation, which is the prohibition, which is you cannot do this and so on. And this big daddy state, you cannot kill, you cannot rape, you cannot do these things. But then there's also the prohibition of the prohibition, which is that that enjoyment of the prohibition itself. And I think that that's the, the interesting relationship that we need to understand. And I think you've understand, Thomas, uh, uh, better than many uh, between Girard, Death Drive and Freud. Because to enjoy the prohibition of the prohibition to enjoy the prohibition itself. My God, tell me no, tell me I can't do this, all these, these pseudo-masochistic things. That is in itself a form of death drive. That is in itself the way out of this suffocating dichotomy between normal time and ritual time. What I want to say is there's, you know, I'm speculating here, let me know what you think. There's sutra, which is, uh, that's, that's the wrong, I'm not gonna go there. Sorry, I take a step back. My point is that there's three, not two, there's three moments all the time. A, B, and then B of B. And if we don't think like that, then we're going to be stuck with these, you know, fake oppositions. I also don't think Nietzsche is a guy who's like, oh, no, let's restrain all this, unrestrain all desire. And then the other Christian guys are, oh, let's contain all desire. I don't think that's true. I think there's a, there's a, there's a twisted third. There's a twisted surplus to this. There's the enjoyment of Nietzsche enjoys overman more than anyone. He enjoys the fact that he's failed so much. Nietzsche is, is, in that sense, a, a, a very kinky man who's found his satisfaction. Is, is an alternative reading, I would suggest. I don't think we're disagreeing with each other. I don't think either. We're just circling around like three oh, authors. It's more fun if you disagree. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. See, this was a beautiful disagreement of disagreement. Okay, we're, we're close to one hour and a half. So is there anything in this chapter? Just to bring it back to this chapter. Um, I got some notes here. So, so let's go through this. Is that okay? Yeah. To see if there is anything we're missing. So basically, we have a, 
So our institutions are based in rituals, right? So so we've we've talked about that, the example of the king, right? So it's it's actually the rituals that produce the institutions, not the other way around, right? So that that we discussed, we discussed sacred kingship. So these are are, are uh, different uh, sections in the chapter. Um, there's also the domestication of animals. Did we talk about that? We, we quickly no. touched upon that. No. No, we didn't. No, this really is also an interesting point, right? So, so how do we did we do domesticate animals? So the, the the usual story is oh we just caught them and then we turned them into sheep, right? Um, <laughs> or or you know well behaving animals. <laughs> but um, Girard says that actually it's different. So these animals, they became domesticated because they were replacements for human sacrifices, right? And they were kept for, uh, for some time. They were treated as a human in order to humanize them. And in order to, to uh, when they were killed, that they were closer to humans. So this is the, the bear ritual that Daniel mentioned, right? Is, is like that. So the bear is treated as a human in order to bring it closer to the human sacrifice. And Girard argues that domestication of animals comes from animals that were kept to slaughter ritually. So this was the transition from human slaughter to animal slaughter in, in, in sacrificial ritual. That's quite an intriguing idea. And he actually also says that you know, humans are kind of omnivores. We are not carnivores. So how did we end up being meat eaters and taking on all those, those big animals? So he claims that uh, hunting was a ritual that originally hunting was again uh, a replacement for human slaughter and that it, it basically uh, that hunt for food comes from hunt for ritual which i i'm not sure if it's correct but it's kind of a mind-boggling idea right yeah it's fascinating and yeah. it, it's it's another point of him trying to critique this cultural platonism right this idea yeah. well if we domesticated animals it must just be because we needed to domesticate animals yeah, and that, that's a bit weird, right? So I mean, it's like, we how would you pet. know that, that this would be possible, right? I, and, uh, yeah. I'm the and only that's... argument I can maybe think against it is if someone realized, hang on, we don't have to go hunting if we keep some sheep, if we catch some of these, and then we can eat them more easily. But I guess yeah, but, yeah. if the theory is that actually the eating of meat came about not just as a natural thing that we did, but as a something that developed through sacrificial institution, and that's how it's got institutionalized, which can even be I, to kind of develop this thought, the big Sunday dinner when you get a big chicken or a big roast pig or a big something like on the table, it is a ritual meal when you get a big bit of animal. Yeah, yeah, there's some ritual aspect to it, right? And uh, yeah, well, the cannibalism is also a standard uh, part of uh, human sacrifice, right? Because the killed scapegoat has this numinous quality, this, this divinity, and by eating the divinity, you, you become part of it, right? Hence cannibalism. So, yeah. So, and then what I also find very interesting in this, in this chapter is that because you have like prohibitions on anything that creates rivalry, right? Women, goods, anything that people want, you put prohibitions on. But then the problem is then you run the risk of, of deadlock, right? Because everything is prohibited. So you need to have some kind of space where the prohibitions are suddenly lifted and go into the opposite. So that's why you have ordinary time time of prohibition and you have ritual time where everything is inverted so and i think we're still in there right we are living in two, two times we're just not aware of it now it's all so unstructured that we kind of organize it ourselves you know we join a football club we go clubbing whatever you know and and we kind of create this kind of ad hoc structure of prohibition and and, and ritual um as as far as we see fit right so far it seems to work but you know it, it could well break down like it did in the in the mid of the 20th century, right, with the Second World War, this was a major breakdown of this, of this, um, of this, this mechanism. So, and then we have death and funeral rites that I found. That's the last part, I think. So that, that's uh, that we can briefly touch upon. So I found that extremely mind-boggling. So, because actually, death is understanding. Death is humanity. It's the first time that. A, cad a cadaver, you know, a corpse was seen. That was the emergence of, of 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 humans, because animals don't have this concept of death, right? So it's it's and and so again, so mimesis, ritual slaughter, um, language, they all arose at the same time, and this is this is highly connected to death, right? It's this understanding that somebody can be killed, that somebody can be dead, 
and that that this is this is associated with the sacred this is associated with god so all gods are dead victims right? basically right so that means that that this is why funerals are they are serious events because mm. anything dead any dead human is associated with ritual space with sacrifice and often in in tribes so when when one community uh, when there is somebody who dies in a community it's actually another community who buries their dead mm. they exchange their debts that's mind-boggling why is that it's because dead people are associated with undifferentiation violence uh, resolution through scapegoating and and that that's a very scary thing so people are are that's why death is a scary thing so you can kind of then then the, the the thing that I was thinking about is are 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 we afraid of death because we are afraid of violent undifferentiation and 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 sacrificial violence? Yeah. So again, that's it, an interesting point, huh? Or an yeah, interesting idea. This to me was was incredible. So it's not so much that death is such an intolerable truth that we have to invent institutions to mask it, but rather that. This, this has to do with that misrecognition of, of is it the victim or is it the process that really does the magic of solving the of solving the the, the mimesis um, when he says that funerary rites are the first design and model for all culture when we said a while ago that the first word ever uttered was murder at the root of all culture is 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 this this understanding of death as a major resource for life it's tricky to understand, especially because we're so used to essentializing. We're, we're all cu cultural platinists in many ways. I'm finding it boggling to, to square my head, right? It's not necessarily that the death of that person created the religion. No, but, but death itself as a thing that happens time and again generates sacredness, especially if you understand it as something that can, can come in and attribute peace and distribute some sort of unification around the tribe. It's a very strange insight. It's a brilliant insight. Yeah, it it, it's very backwards too it, it's like if gerard's hypothesis is correct that the foundation of culture is the murder of a victim and the sacralized and the, or the pacifying effect of that then every corpse we encounter is a reminder of that it's a reminder of the sacred it's a reminder of the pacifying effect of the divinity Just, which and this this bit's brilliant because it's gerard again criticizing his enlightenment colleagues on their views of religion and positing a completely different interpretation of religion he's like no this this enlightenment argument that religion is there because we're so afraid of death that we'd have to come up with some bullshit metaphysics to hide it is wrong actually religious people are totally reasonable for having some kind of theory and some kind of uh special uh response to death in fact our naturalistic conception of it is kind of the deluded stance yeah so it's uh, it's it's putting philosophy which has certainly its uses it's putting uh philosophy at the center it's as if these primitive people had philosophical insight like we actually know that when we die it we, we it's just over but we cannot deal with this fact and therefore we're going to invent religion this is the typical story of Dawkins and a lot of philosophy, right? And, and Nietzsche and stuff like that. And this seems to be utterly wrong. This seems to be utterly wrong because that's not how, how, how humanization works. This is simply not uh, how our, the structure of our thinking itself comes from this sacrificial structure. So we think in terms of this sacrificial structure, we cannot get out of that. So and afterwards, we can, of course, come up with with theories and philosophize and things like that but we still the concepts themselves they come from this sacrificial structure so we are actually it's a bit like a fish we're like a fish in water right we cannot think ourselves out of this water spirit is not a bone gerard would say spirit is a cadaver a cadaver as a talisman the talisman of culture the culture which is itself a tomb for this cadaver yeah, spirit is a is a spirit is a corpse. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a spirit is a is a corpse in a tomb. Yeah, that's a, yeah. that's what Girard would say. Like, and he said, like you know, the first pyramid was the pile of stones after a stoning. That was the first pyramid. That's one of his, wow. his statements in the, in this. The chapter. first yeah. word was not mama; it was murder. 
It was murder, yeah. And this is the Copernican uh, Copernican revolution, right? So, and if this is true, then all of our 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 big philosophers, you know, and especially people like Heidegger and Nietzsche and Freud, they need to be and and Foucault, they need to be on reread and interpreted from this point of view, because suddenly everything becomes a bit more, both more simple and much more complicated, right? So, for example, the, the whole idea of Foucault is like everything, all these prohibitions, right? It's just power. You know, all of these, these rules and regulations around sexuality. And, and this is just powerful people who come up with good uh, stories to regulate other people, right? And this seems to be completely wrong. This seems to be completely wrong. Prohibitions, of course, I mean, sometimes people, uh, th there are certain cases of people using religious structures for power games, of course. But it seems to be that religion has a very, very important uh, role, and that is to keep mimetic uh, desire, mimetic uh, rivalry getting, getting out of hand. That is the reason for all these prohibitions, and especially sexual prohibitions, because people compete about goods and about women, right? And that's, it's not like everything is, 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 a, is a power that that's just, a, that seems to be like a, an, an, a, an idea that that seems to be reasonable from a, from a rational point of view, well, a seemingly rational point of view, but it seems to go very much against anthropology, the anthropo anthropological reality that structures are thinking. This is fantastic. I can't help but to think about the role of prohibition and desire uh, as applied to the here and now. Uh, when Foucault speaks about power and institutions, uh, my mind immediately went to the fact that he was a very uh, sexually active and adventurous man. And I couldn't help but to think also of the role of prohibition, of renunciation, of, of the use of prohibition in, in, the in the production of desire inside the bedroom and on the screen. And a lot, of these, a lot of these thinkers are, are living or trying to live in ritual time yes, at all right. times. This is what, what, what Nietzsche basically did. Nietzsche lived in ritual time. And then they write from that point of view and they seem to think like, well, you know, this is, this is, the, this is the only time. And I, 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 I describe how to be in this, in this time. And they don't understand that they're kind of seeing, seeing half of the equation. But there's an oscillation going on. You know, the eternal recurrence of Nietzsche. I mean, I, I interpret that as the eternal recurrence of you know peaceful time, mimetic conflict, slaughter, resolution, again and again and again. Will to power is nothing else than than you you want to get the object away from the model and you want to win. Ressentiment is nothing else than you want to get the, the object from the model and you fail. The will to power and ressentiment they're the same thing. They're the both sides of the same coin. And then there's another thing, you know, this, this, uh, I'm thinking about this camel, lion, and child thing of Nietzsche, right? This, okay, this, this is kind of a, kind of a poetic um, uh, interpretation, right? But what is that? What, what else is it? And the camel is prohibition, is the boring prohibition. The, the lion, that's the violence of, 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 of going against, breaking these prohibitions of undifferentiation. The child, that stands both for the peace, you know, the, the peace and the innocence of the child, but also the child as sacrifice. Children are, are very common. Sacri child sacrifice was very common, right? So you can kind of easily interpret camel, lion, and child as, as, as some kind of, again, through a glass darkly in, in a reformulation of the sacred of the eternal recurrence of, of sacrificial structure. He himself says that power I find Nietzsche, is there. Every time I read Nietzsche, I kind of see like, whoa, this is basically, Nietzsche constantly writes about sacrifice and the Dionysian, and Nietzsche is deeply into this Dionysian sacrificial culture. He wants to resurrect that, and Heidegger is also like that. They're pagans, basically. But he's a very conscious pagan in many ways uh, when he but writes. Nietzsche, the... I don't think so at all. I think Nietzsche is in, huh? Nietzsche is in term. I don't think Nietzsche is very conscious. Well, yeah, he's very conscious about he's very conscious about what he, what's going on in him, and he just writes it down, right? But but he's not conscious about the great the bigger structures and the bigger forces that are moving him. I don't think he's conscious at all. That's why he's so much fun. That's why people read him because he's so he's, he's it's like Rick, Rick, Nietzsche's poetry. Nietzsche is not a systematic thinker. I mean, I'm totally disagree with Heidegger's interpretation of Nietzsche. And he turned it in, in, into a, everybody turn, tries to turn Nietzsche into this very systematic thinker, right? I mean, why would you do that? That's not where, where Nietzsche's value lies. Nietzsche I, lies in this. this like this. This. This is a message from hell, basically. It's fascinating to think Nietzsche 
you know, he starts his career with the birth of tragedy, writing about the origination of tragedy as a genre in ritual, in dance, in song. Yeah. You can connect that back through a Girardian reading, right, to, you know, what I was saying earlier, imagining what do the people chant when the ritual is actually going on. I think in, as an artist, that's precisely what Nietzsche is trying to do. He wants to be the guy singing the song at the ritual. And that's yeah, why reading is artist is artist artist associated with ritual space, right? Yeah. So I think that a lot of the West, so the West gets its ritual kick from you know sport events, from uh, you know clubbing, and from art in general. That's the, that's that sexual persona by Paglia, right? It's basically two thousand years of, of 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 ritual surviving in in a Christian context. It goes into it goes into art. Even yeah. Christian art was 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 full of you know, violent, violent depictions from the Bible and, and, and obvious sexual, sexual uh, um, um, uh, depictions. And, and basically a lot of the paganism, a lot of the, of the Dionysian, a lot of the, the ritual space went into art. Not especially you, you tragedy. Cannot, you, cannot only, you cannot have a sutra only. You cannot have like a prohibition, only religion. You need to have pro prohibition and then ritual. And these need to cycle. And even if you get rid, I think hopefully it is possible to have this prohibition and ritual without scapegoating because if that's not possible then humanity will not survive which is why i come back to this point about the ritual and the prohibition and the prohibition of ritual and prohibition as ritual so you know you have the like again death drive again the, the enjoyment of of the prohibition itself as the generator of pleasure that feels to me something to be thought in in, in Girardian terms and that that i think would prove very very useful yeah but the, the 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 prohibitions that are there in 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 ordinary time they they get turned around they get broken in in ritual time and that's where the that's 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 where the ritual ecstasy the the what 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 uh What's his name again? Otto, I think, called it uh, um, what the numinous. I think he believed he called it. I mean, that's that's exactly how it works. You know, you have you have prohibitions in ordinary time, and then in ritual time, they they get distorted or broken or transformed. And and but but you have to have a, a clear delineation between these two, and that is becoming more and more unclear in our society. That are we in ritual space? Or are we not in ritual space? I think that many people don't know anymore. You know that if you're if you're intoxicated, you're in ritual space. But if you if you can go to work or you know if you walk around intoxicated and you you try also try to have an ordinary life, then you have like this blend of prohibition and 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 ritual, which will probably destroy you. I mean, Nietzsche did say explicitly that power is, is greater than life. That sometimes li life has to overcome itself or, or is overcome by love and will of power. So he himself was, was open to that idea. He was open to the idea of self-sacrifice as a, as a faithfulness to power or to continuing this, these cycles of desire that so energized him. Well, but Girard would, would death. basically argue that 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 Nietzsche became became a sacrificial scapegoat himself right because I, he, he went so deep into the Dionysian and then and then rejected the prohibition in this case it was Christianity that was scapegoated and he, he ended up be, being a being a uh, his, his 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 way of thinking his way of living caused him to end up as a scapegoat himself he scapegoated himself which you mentioned a couple of times Daniel so I think, uh, yeah, and then there are these stories that, you know, Nietzsche's father was sick and he probably inherited a disease that doesn't seem to be true because his father actually had an accident. And then also the, the syphilis story that also turned out to be very unlikely because the incubation period is all wrong. So, and it turned out that Nietzsche did, a, so there's this, uh, there's this philosopher, Peter schuster Hughes. he has written a very interesting article about it. And Nietzsche was a psychonaut, right? Nietzsche took a lot of drugs. When all kinds of mysterious drugs, we don't really know what they were. Nietzsche had a very, very deeply Dionysian lifestyle, and in the end, it seemed to have killed him. 
he was just a plant the last 10 years of his life and it seemed to have been uh, it might have well been a, a consequence of, of, of his celebration of the Dionysian without any prohibition and of course yes I know you can find a lot of things in, in Nietzsche where he says the opposite yes but he was the prophet of the Dionysian right and he rejected prohibition that's how i take how i would summarize nietzsche he, as, as a, a Dionysian, he was crucified as well and he was crucified so again somebody like christ right a, a revelation but not some somebody to follow i would say it's fascinating right if you just read say sophocles in translation it's very similar to what nietzsche writes like nietzsche's style is the oration of tragic poetry Hmm. Yeah. yeah similar like with shakespeare's yeah. tragedies as well what happens is you've got these stories of catastrophic destruction of a person with a chorus standing on musing quite fascinatingly on life and its impossibilities and philosophical matters and so on that is tragedy as a genre tragedy is the downfall of someone in a horrible way plus deep meditations on life, really profound meditations on life. There seems to be something connected to it. You can get into a really profound state of insight in these ritual containers. But I think Nietzsche is just there all the time. That's why his writing is so brilliant. That's why he's not a philosopher in the way that other philosophers are, because he started with studying the Greeks and tragedy deeply. He started with ritual, whereas most people start with um, logic. He self-styled himself or, as that. Or like Hegel, which is yeah. to, sorry. He, he like self-styled Hegel, himself Hegel, as that Hegel. celebrity that that allowed himself to trans, to transgress. He self-styled himself as that as this transgressor, as the sacrifice in waiting. He, it was it's it's written in there. It's written in there. People who take up this lifestyle, they understand. That's the tragedy of it. So you have you have like Girard saying a couple of things like okay so he has this sacrificial structure right and then he says like well then he 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 contrasts it with all the other explanations of how humans uh, work right and he mentions uh, um, mysticism Girard is said like that's not an explanation uh, the misunderstood Dionysian of Nietzsche the the negation and of of Hegel. Um, the smart priests who are using religion to uh, yield power, that's Voltaire. Um, obscured being, which is nothing else than the obscuration of the sacrificial structure of Heidegger. And then the, the, the numinous, the, the, the religious thing that is beyond explanation of Rudolf Otto and of, uh, of, uh, of Jung. So he re rejects all of these. He rejects all of these as failed, failed explanations. So that's maybe a hard pill to swallow for our Hegelian friends. I'm always a bit like, you know, careful with bringing it up. But uh, like Hegel also, for Hegel, the, the, the anthropology is master-slave, right? And then Girard would say like, well, master-slave, that cannot be the origin of, of anthropology. That cannot be the origin of humanization. But master-slave already presupposes culture. So it cannot be that. That is a wrong explanation. That's a tricky one, right? So precisely on that, on page 59, uh, Girard says, we should, precisely about returning to Hegel or Nietzsche, he says that we should not allow the last ditch efforts of classificatory rationalism, which oppose, amounts to the opposite of reason, to divert our attention from the essential paradox. And he, then he goes on to say that some philosophers and so many scientists, they just want to smooth out contradictions somehow. And he says that that temptation should be resisted. Isn't that Hegel? Isn't that what Hegel says as well? Like how 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 is he going against Hegel in in in? Yeah, like, yeah actually, Hegel, he writes right? some somewhere that uh, he he's not sure whether he's arguing against Hegel or against Hegelians, right? Who who use yeah. because I mean many people use go to Kozhev instead of Hegel himself, right? So actually, when I talk to Hegelians, they seem to get something out of it because I usually think they, they are onto something. So it cannot be completely wrong. Um, but, but Girard writes you know, on page 59, there can be no question of returning to Hegel or Nietzsche. Yes. Wow. And I like that. I kind of like that, that Girard is so, you know, there's, there's a truth out there, right? This is how it is. And, and all of these, all of these thinkers that many people kind of they just go like oh 
they read all these thinkers and then they try to combine all of these thinkers. And Girard is actually saying, you know, you know like it's like this. And it's not like that. That might be like, for example, Derrida, though he criticizes Derrida, but he also said Derrida is very useful, you know, deconstruction. Derrida wrote Plato's Pharmacy, which is a great analysis of, of the pharmacon. But at the end of the day, Derrida stops at deconstruction and he doesn't go all the way to kind of really unearthing this, 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 this mechanism that led to uh, homogenization and culture. So Derrida is incomplete. We need to go all the way, not only the deconstruction, but also on under, the underlying structure that explain uh, the, 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 the being of humans. And, and I find that very attractive and, and I, find, I find it quite convincing, actually. I think, Funnily enough, I was actually around, what, just, just try, what's me. happening there is even <laughs> Hegel accounts for this within his system, which is the idea that we have to update our knowing, our systems, our interpretation of the philosophy of the past in light of what science announced in the present. I, I do think I find, I mean, Hegel and Gerard is such another massive topic, right? Uh, I don't yeah. think I really do justice that day, especially as I need to fuck off in a second. Um, I think there's a lot that's very useful in Hegel too. And I think probably from what I know of Hegel, he'd appreciate being read in the light of Girard. Here's what, here's a, a sentence that I'm going to read where I think Girard is being the deepest possible Hegelian. There can be no question of returning to mystical formulations or their philosophical counterparts, such as the coincidencia oppositorum, the, power, the magical power of the negative and the value of the Dionysian. So here Gerard is saying, we don't go back to the magic of negativity. We don't go back to mysticism. We don't go back to need. And then he says the following. There can be no question of returning to Hegel or Nietzsche. But in saying this, he's returning to Hegel. So my point is, how to say this? There is no disagreement between Gerard and, and Hegel in this. Uh, Gerard is trying to hold the paradox of the original sacrifice and trying to sort of keep it as a cern of his thinking and not smooth it out. And isn't that what Hegel says with tarrying with negativity as well? It is only perhaps naive Hegelians who say, oh, no, no, the negative is, is magical uh, and, and they don't really like think things. And in this, I think Girard is just going against his contemporaries as opposed to making any proper critique of, of Hegel because he's too smart to just uh, to just on a whim just go well, again. Doing like that. He's arguing with his historical colleagues. Exactly. The point exactly. of the dialectic is that knowledge moves by arguing between colleagues. Yeah. yeah. It's not one person's frozen system forever. Yeah. This is not, he's too smart to make his anti Hegelianism sit on this paragraph. He knows better. As well as when he goes anti Freudian or anti whatever. Now, he's very precise and he says, like, if you read him properly and if we don't go into the polemics, he actually goes and dissects it. And precisely in that dissection, I think that he is complementary to all these thinkers. And that's sort of my project with this series. Uh, okay, so now we, we bumped against a rock of Hegel and, uh, and, and we, we shipwrecked. So maybe this is a good, <laughs> good point to stop. <laughs> good, but. Uh... Yeah, I think we went through most of the important stuff in this chapter. So for yeah. those people who are still listening, so this is just chapter two. So there are 12 more of these chapters. <laughs> so this is quite a big undertaking, but, uh, but it's, I think it's very um, worthwhile to go through a book like this and, and really discuss it in depth. So. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> So thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for, for these beautiful two hours. Thank you, everybody who's, who's still listening. And we'll see you next time. Absolutely. Have a good one.